Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD, General Physician. All my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. In continuity with the previous lecture series in Neurology, today we will be discussing on one of the very interesting topic, very frequently asked as a full question in your theory particularly for fourth year students and also very frequently a long case like hemiplegia very frequently given in your oral exams so pay attention this will be very useful to you in your exam as well as in your everyday practice also you will see good number of cases with strokes and TIA So stroke is indirectly a heart attack of brain. So it is also called brain heart attack. Because it results into damage to the brain. That is we call necrosis or infarct of a brain. So it is called brain heart attack. Or also called cerebrovascular disease. Cerebrovascular accident and also called as brain attack. We will be discussing under three common heading definition, etiology, pathophysiology and then in second part we will be discussing on how you approach to a person and how you try to investigate and treat. So this is one example 84 year old female presented in an emergency room with left sided weakness and numbness found to have a massive ischemic stroke discharged to rehabilitation center. There is another person 63 year old in emergency room alter mental status found to have a hemorrhagic stroke and the case or we call lost the patient. 34 year old female admitted with lupus flare develop a right side leg weakness found to have an embolic stroke discharge to a rehabilitation center so these are different types of presentation but all are strokes here you can see that female 74 year admitted in an early am for weakness and fatigue a, a fellow nurse calls you to tell you i am not sure what is going on with my lady in here but when i got here she immediately leaned into me and said, I am very weak and my left side is heavy feeling. This patient has a history of mild hypertension and family stated that their doctor said to have an irregular heartbeat, meaning person is probably having atrial flutter or fibrillation and that has led to an embolic phenomena. So these are all different varieties of strokes. So stroke is a sudden onset of focal neurological impairment that can be due to specific location or in the brain, retina or spinal cord. So it is a damage to brain, retina or spinal cord resulting into focal neurological impairment. And this is due to vascular pathophysiology. So clinical syndrome consisting of Rapidly developing clinical signs of focal or a global in case of a coma. Disturbances in cerebral function lasting for more than 24 hours or leading to death with no apparent cause other than vascular origin. So this has to be because of lack of blood supply to brain. And that is given name stroke or we also call cerebrovascular stroke or also, there is another term called brain heart attack. So, there is one variety we call as a ischemic stroke. Ischemic stroke is a life-threatening event in which the part of the brain does not receive enough oxygen, usually due to a blood clot lodged in a cerebral artery. While there is another variety we call as a transient ischemic attack or also labeled as a mini stroke results when the cerebral artery is temporarily blocked decreasing the blood flow to the brain 
many stroke results from a complete blockage of the cerebral artery leading to death of brain cells and permanent loss of certain functions so tia is a temporary block while stroke is a complete block leading to a brain damage while in a case of a tia even on ct there is no evidence of infarct so it is temporary so transient ischemic attack is tissue based definition transient episodes of neurological dysfunction caused by a focal brain by focal brain spinal cord or retinal ischemia without evidence of acute infarct while stroke syndrome of rapidly developing lasting either focal or global neurological dysfunction with no apparent cause other than vascular origin so it has to be a vascular origin this is also vascular origin but this is transient episode and strokes can be divided into two big group ischemic and hemorrhagic ischemic accounts for 85% of the stroke while hemorrhagic accounts for only 15% of the strokes so transient ischemic attack again is a focal neurological symptoms resulting from the brain retinal or spinal cord ischemia and there is an absence of infarction on neurology or neuroimaging and independent of the symptoms duration previously there was one definition which was being introduced was less than 24 hour that particular is gone tia is a neurological emergency because within 48 to 90 days there is an increased risk of stroke the person who gets a tia so person will have a very high chance of developing a stroke within 48 hours or in 90 days there is a increased risk of a stroke and for that you can go for abcd scores and try to identify how much is a risk so tia is considered as a medical emergency and can result into permanent tissue injury that is infarction even when the focal transient neurological symptoms last less than 1 hour so this is a medical emergency because usually it does not last for longer than 1 hour but can end up into a warning sign and patient should seek immediate medical treatment because one in three patient will progress to ischemic stroke and that is the reason why tia is considered as medical emergency so stroke is like an acute coronary syndrome 12 to 20% risk of getting a serious damage to the brain and you can easily identify by what we call as rapid estimation that is fast face deformity arm will show you decrease power speech will be disturbed and you have to act very fast as far as the abd abcd score is concerned it is called abcd2 so age more than 60 one score blood pressure more than 140 90 one score clinical features of tia unilateral weakness to speed disturbances without weakness one duration wise more than 60 minutes to less than 60 minute one less than 10 minute zero and if there is a diabetes diagnosis with diabetes one score and you have to utilize this score to find out two days risk for subsequent stroke will be higher if the score is between 0 to 3 it is 1% between 4 to 5 4% so person will have a higher chance of risk if the risk score is higher hence this has to be taken as an emergency because once a person develops ischemic damage it can be irreversible so difference between ischemic stroke and tia usually tia will last less than 24 hour but this definition is gone by and large it is lasting for less than 1 hour neurological symptoms are present in both focal brain 
damage is more common with ischemic strokes while here it is there is no focal brain damage so brain spinal cord or retinal ischemia is there no infarct of the tissue while here there is an infarct of tissue symptoms is variable depending upon the location of ischemia while symptoms variable on the size and location of the infarct and neurological deficit remains longer than tia so this is the main difference between tia and ischemic stroke as far as clinical picture is concerned so thrombotic stroke will block the blood vessel and decrease the blood supply to the brain and that is good number of time described as a step ladder pattern of weakness while in an embolic stroke there will be acute onset in a small area and it will be because of complete blockage of the artery while cerebral hemorrhage is because of rupture of a artery and leading to leak of a blood and that is called cerebral hemorrhage which will be acute in onset and progressive and there will be chance of deterioration so sudden brain damage because of lack of blood flow to the brain caused by a clot or by a rupture of blood vessel when it is a occlusion we call occlusive variety or we call ischemic stroke that ischemic stroke can be occlusion by thrombosis or thromboembolism so that is called ischemic stroke which is accounting for nearly 85% of the stroke while hemorrhagic stroke is because of bleeding in or around the brain around the brain is subarachnoid hemorrhage which is very frequently because of rupture of aneurysm or av malformations and the aneurysm which is very very common is berry aneurysm while bleeding inside the brain is called intracranial hemorrhage maybe intraventricular or parenchyma and that is very frequently because of hypertensive complications <coughs> sorry and that is accounting for 15% of the strokes so stroke is defined as a clinical syndrome of rapid onset of cerebral deficit usually focal or may be generalized lasting for more than 24 hours may lead to death but no apparent cause other than vascular one complete stroke means deficit has become maximum and usually within 6 hours stroke in evolution means there is a gradual progressive damage which is taking place in brain during first 24 hours minor stroke is usually one of the part of tia patient recovers without significant deficit usually within a week that is described as a minor stroke but by and large now mini stroke is utilized the word for tia transient ischemic attack means a focal deficit such as a weak limb aphasia loss of vision means damage to the brain or to the brain stem or to the retina for few seconds to 24 hours and there is a complete recovery and this is usually acute in onset and very frequently it will end into a full brown stroke there is one word very frequently utilized in stroke that is called ischemic penumbra this is an area surrounding the infarcted area which is potentially reversible the main goal of the stroke therapy is to preserve this ischemic penumbra so the central part there is a necrosis and surrounding area there is an ischemic zone and this can be survived by early treatment and that's why it is called potentially reversible and that is labeled as ischemic penumbra so normal terminology which are very frequently utilized is ischemic and hemorrhagic ischemic is 85% percent 
hemorrhagic is 15 percent of this ischemic stroke the common we come across is transient ischemic attack thrombosis embolism there is one more terminology utilized where you get a damage to deeper structures like basal ganglia etc where small arteries are being involved we call lacunar infarcts and where the what we call as cryptogenic where we cannot identify the exact cause and we also labeled as a watershed areas where the two boundaries of two different territories if that area is involved that is called watershed areas in hemorrhagic stroke we come across two common variety of which we come across 85 percent of the time cerebral hemorrhage which can be intracranial hemorrhage or we call intracerebral hemorrhage and intraventricular hemorrhage while outside the brain we call subarachnoid hemorrhage and that is accounting for 15 percent of this hemorrhagic stroke so major part in a hemorrhagic is cerebral hemorrhage while 15 percent is subarachnoid hemorrhage depending upon the circulation it is called total anterior circulation in fact short form it is called TACIE CI Partial anterior circulation infarct is called PACI and lacunar infarct is called LACI, lacunar infarct and posterior circulation is called POCI. These are the few terms which are being utilized as far as arterial involvement is concerned, which territory is being involved. So these are some of the terminology which is very frequently utilized in stroke depending upon the circulation anterior circulation posterior circulation there is one classification which is by Bamford classification or Oxford stroke classification unilateral hemiparesis hemisensory loss homonymous hemianopia and higher cortical deficit can be divided into total anterior circulatory strokes here they label as TACS, total anterior circulatory stroke, instead of here it is infarct. Here they label as stroke, partial anterior circulatory stroke, posterior circulatory stroke, and lacunar strokes. So these are the terms. So here it is anterior and middle cerebral artery, while here partial may be small arteries of middle cerebral or isolated cortical deficits while here in a posterior circulation it is a vertebro basilar artery territory and in a lacunar infarct it is a deep penetrating branches around the internal capsule and damaging the internal capsule or thalamus or basal ganglia they are described as lacunar strokes so again same infarct 85 percent hemorrhagic 15 percent in fact the commonest etiology is atherosclerosis which is accounting for 60 percent and not atherosclerosis is 40 percent atherosclerosis can end up with thrombosis which will be most common while embolic stroke will be another group because secondary due to thrombus formation then we usually label that as thromboembolic while non-atherosclerosis can result due to embolism which is accounting for 50 percent and this embolus can be fat embolus air embolus nitrogen embolus amniotic fluid embolus etc so this will be combined together and you can have an embolus from non-atherosclerotic that is cardiovascular system that is 50 percent of those will be thromboembolism from cardiac that is like acute myocardial infarction valvular heart disease which can be infective emboli etc while hemorrhagic stroke intracranial hemorrhage 85 percent and the most common cause of that is hypertension which is accounting for 70 percent and secondary to hypertension along with av malformation and amyloid disorders almost accounting for 30 percent while subarachnoid hemorrhage is because of rupture of aneurysm almost in 85% of the group 
And in 15% of group, we may not be able to identify the etiology. These are the different etiology in case of stroke. So we usually divide into arterial stroke. There is also one group we call it the venous thrombosis and miscellaneous group. But by and large, we come across arterial groups that is thrombosis, embolism, hemorrhage, TIA, and also don't forget a group called hypertensive and cephalopathy. We already shown you this. This will be group of etiology. So 85% ischemic, of which 55% is thrombotic, 30% is embolic. In this thrombotic episode, lacunar infarct and large vessels will be, you can divide into lacunar 20% and large vessel is 35%. In embolic, it is artery to artery embolization, while cardioembolic is mainly very, very frequently because of atrial flutter fibrillation, ischemic heart disease resulting into mural thrombus and thromboembolism. And don't forget valvular heart disease, which can also end up with infective endocarditis and can result into infective embolus. And then later on, we'll end up with brain abscess. While hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral, cerebellar, and secondary due to trauma also, you can end up with subdural, extradural hematomas. That can be one of the another group of disorders. So etiology of ischemic stroke can be thrombotic, lacunar strokes, large vessel thrombus, hypercoagulable disorders, while embolic from artery to artery, coronary carotid bifurcation, aortic arch, cardioembolic will be atrial fibrillation, myocardial infarction, mural thrombus following a myocardial infarction, bacterial endocarditis, mitral stenosis, Paradoxical embolization, not very common. It is rather rare. So there are some terms which will be there. We also have got one big group we call as a cryptogenic where we cannot identify the cause. Cardiogenic embolus will be accounting for 20%. Lacunar infarct around 25%. And atherosclerotic cardiovascular disorders around 20%. Hemorrhagic stroke is 12%. So you can see that this is a big group. Hemorrhagic accounting for only 12 to 15%, while rest is all what we call as ischemic group of strokes. Here it is 88. So 12% is hemorrhagic. And there will be some group which will mimic strokes. Don't forget hypoglycemia, etc. We'll be talking about those. So, cryptogenic, lacunar infarct, cardioembolic, large vessel atherosclerosis accounts for a big group. And in cardioembolic, atrial fibrillation, prosthetic wall, LV aneurysm, endocarditis, acute MI. While small vessels, infarcts, lacunar infarcts. And cryptogenic, very frequently, maybe because of hypercoagulable stage, occult atrial fibrillation, paradoxical embolization with ASD, etc. So don't forget those groups. And rare groups, carotid artery dissection, hypotension, shock. So we already mentioned embolic phenomena, thrombus, very frequently because of atherosclerosis, vasculitis, dissection. And abnormal clotting can occur in case of hyperviscosity syndrome, polycythemia, clotting disorders, those groups. So these are some of the conditions which will come across like atrial fibrillation, valvular heart disease, LV thrombi. This will be cardioembolics while artery to artery very frequently because of atherosclerosis will be resulting into artery to artery while penetrating artery disease very commonly because of hypertensive complications and also can be secondary due to vasculitis. 
we know very well atherosclerosis can be secondary due to modifiable risk factor non modifiable risk factor and they can end up in tia or thrombotic stroke or thromboembolic phenomena modifiable cause like hypertension hyperlipidemia smoking diabetes cardiovascular complications like atrial flutter fibrillation carotid artery disease coagulatory disorders obesity lack of exercise heavy alcohol cocaine use all these will be modifiable risk factors and non modifiable risk factors like age sex race hereditary factors or we call familial factors so if we try to reduce all this modifiable risk factor the risk of tia and ischemic stroke will reduce now there are some potentially modifiable risk factors like diabetes and hypo hyper homocysteine urea should be also well controlled so all these factors you have to keep it in mind as far as intracranial hemorrhage is concerned primary cause in intracranial hemorrhage is very commonly because of hypertension use of anticoagulants use of fibrinolytic drugs or use of fibrinolysis bleeding disorders and antiplatelet drugs will be very very common while secondary groups in intracranial hemorrhage vascular malformation aneurysms hemorrhagic stroke converted into infarct hemorrhagic strokes which is a transformation of a cerebral infarct because of use of drugs or because of anticoagulants or uh, what we call as a thrombolysis venous infarct with hemorrhagic secondary to cerebral venous thrombosis and there is one more disease of a blood vessels that is moya moya that is also one variety of a disorders can end up with intracerebral hemorrhage these are the strokes mimics hypoglycemia post ictal phase in seizure migraine with aura hypertensive encephalopathy central nervous system with abscess or tumors certain drugs can also produce weakness and can produce stroke mimics and never forget psychogenic or we call hysterical as far as a pathophysiology is concerned will be dividing into two big groups that is hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic strokes basic in ischemic stroke it is because of the occlusion either by thrombosis or by embolism while in hemorrhagic stroke it is a rupture of a blood vessel resulting into leak of a blood outside the vascular territory and very frequently it is because of hypertension or because of the basic arterial disease like aneurysm av malformation etc in occlusive it is due to closure of the blood vessel and this is very frequently secondary due to atherosclerosis and damage to the endothelium resulting into thrombus formation which will occlude the lumen while in hemorrhagic it is because of the rupture of the blood vessel secondary due to hypertension or the blood vessels which are being already malformed like aneurysm or av malformation so arterial embolism from the distant site or arterial thrombosis at the site of the damage because of atherosclerosis or intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage less commonly venous infarct arterial dissection very very rare hyperviscosity syndrome can end up embolization say may be fat emboli or air emboli or amniotic fluid embolization etc in multiple sclerosis and may be secondary due to brain tumor abscess subdural hematoma etc can also produce damage to the brain and can mimic like stroke don't forget odd conditions 
like sle neurosyphilis arthritis those group can also result into stroke types of symptoms and signs now taking part by part in thrombosis secondary due to atherosclerosis initially there will be partial occlusion because of partial occlusion person will get some symptoms and signs which may not be persistent and then as the occlusion goes on increasing the symptom signs persist and there will be increase in the symptoms and signs further it will remain for few days or few hours and then you can have further aggravation of the symptoms this is the reason why it is called step ladder pattern and once there is a complete occlusion 100% occlusion now there will be ischemia ischemia will end up into necrosis and there will be a central area of necrosis surrounded by a zone of ischemia which is called penubra ischemic penubra if treated early that zone can be survived but the central zone which has undergone necrosis those symptoms and signs will persist while in case of an embolic phenomena it is a dislodgement of a embolus from the primary site and it occludes the small size artery so it will produce minimal area damage and good number of time this embolus can get organized or can be from thrombolyzed by our natural defense mechanism we call plasmin which is activated part of a plasminogen which will lyse the embolus and circulation may be reestablished person may not have a permanent signs and that can happen in case of a small emboli now depending upon the size of the artery usually in a big size artery like carotid artery there will be initially partial occlusion but in case of a medium size artery like branches of mca aca territory or vertebro basilar artery territory being a little small size artery the chances will be early occlusion and symptom signs will appear early while in a penetrating branch which are the branches from middle cerebral artery supplying a deeper structures like internal capsule thalamus basal ganglia etc when those arteries are involved it will result into a small area of infarct and that is called lacunar infarcts now partial occlusion will result into ischemia which will be very frequently reversible and occasionally may end up into irreversible damage while complete 100% occlusion lasting for a longer period with result into necrosis or we we'll call infarct and which will be irreversible damage medium size artery will usually give rise to a bigger area of supply of the brain so there will be larger area of damage while a very small size artery which is very frequently occluded by an embolus will give rise to small area of damage while penetrating branch will give rise to the deeper structure damage and that will be again in a small area of damage but you might have a important area of the brain which will be involved in those lacunar infarcts so this is in short the circle of willis and the different arterial blood supply and how it results into occlusive variety and hemorrhagic variety so this is showing you occlusive variety this is circle of willis i am not going into detail that this circle of willis is formed by 
vertebral basilar artery these are the two vertebral arteries becomes basilar artery and then it bifurcates into posterior cerebral there is a communicating posterior communicating branch this is internal carotid artery which bifurcates into middle cerebral and anterior cerebral anterior cerebral will be communicated by anterior communicating branch and this makes a circle so this is called circle of willis and this is very important if one of the this is indirectly a natural collaterals between anterior circulation and posterior circulation and hence in a case of one side damage there can be a blood supply from opposite side or blood supply can be from anterior circulation to posterior circulation so this is a very important site of a circulation that is called circle of willis now in short whenever you get ischemia occlusion no glucose no oxygen supply no energy and because there is no energy no atp generation so now there is a cytotoxic edema because of high sodium and high calcium so water will move inside and sodium will move inside and it will give rise to cerebral edema so there is a build up of reactive oxygen species damage to lipid in the mitochondria and lysosomal lysosomes release of apoptosis including factors and degrading enzymes then it will result into permanent damage to cerebral neurons and this will be a sign of infarct so arterial occlusion leads to ischemia also there will be release of glutamate glutamate receptor which will give rise to sodium and calcium influx inside the cell because of ischemia energy failure that will also give rise to calcium and sodium influx proteolysis membrane and skeletal breakdown and cell death at the same time thrombolysis and thrombectomy reperfusion because of this reperfusion there will be two response one free radical formation and also inflammatory response also because of arterial occlusion also you can get an inflammatory response which will result into leukocyte adhesions arachnoidic acid production which will again release free radical formations because of free radical formations you can have a lipolysis which can again result into arachnoidic production and also phospholipase and that phospholipase will break down the cell wall and can result into cell death as well as reperfusion has given rise to free radical that free radical can give rise to energy failure mitochondrial damage apoptosis etc indirectly all this mechanism will finally end up into cell death that is necrosis so inflammatory damage blood brain barrier damage vasogenic edema mass effect and then you can end up with what we call as raised intracranial pressure and herniation which can be cingulate herniation uncle herniation or tonsillar herniation and in case of a tonsillar herniation it will be life threatening because skull is a fixed bone and if you get vasogenic edema you are bound to have raise intracranial pressure so this is cytotoxic edema this is vasogenic edema because of ischemia it can result into inflammatory damage which we have already shown you here it can result into inflammatory response and edema formation because of influx of calcium and sodium so we have got two types of strokes ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic strokes ischemic stroke is most common type of a strokes and caused by blockage of the blood vessels and this may be due to hardening and narrowing of the artery secondary due to atherosclerosis or by the blood clot from the cardio embolic phenomena 
or maybe because of air emboli or fat emboli or infective emboli from infective, embo infective endocarditis. While hemorrhagic strokes is very frequently because of the rupture of blood vessel, which may be diseased or maybe a congenital malformation like berry aneurysms and secondary due to hypertension. Lacunar infarcts, we have already explained, it is a penetrating branch of a MCA territory which is supplying internal capsule or say maybe hypothalamus, thalamus, basal ganglia, etc. And that results into necrosis. There is a cyst-like appearance and that's called lakes and that's why it is called lacunar strokes. And this particular is very frequently secondary due to hypertension and diabetes. So this is the most common cause for lacunar infarcts. Shock can also end up with a stroke because of damage to the tissue which is on a border of two artery territory. That is called as injury to watershed areas. And that is called watershed infarcts. Say a border of MCA territory and ACA territory. So that will be one of the area where you can get watershed area infarcts. And that will be very frequently in a case of a stroke. Secondary due to shock because of reduced blood flow to the brain. Now, whenever you get a stroke, you can have a focal motor deficits either because of the damage to the cortex or to the brainstem. And we always apply a rule of four. That is, whenever there is in the brainstem, we get four cranial nerve involved in midbrain, pons and medulla. So it is called rules of four. Cranial nerve then we divide into 12 in the midline. And cranial nerve that do not divide evenly into 12 is called lateral. We'll be mentioning that in a short. This is a very, very long topic. I will try to make it as short as possible. In a cortical damage, it can be anterior cerebral artery territory or middle cerebral artery territory or posterior cerebral artery territory. And posterior cerebral artery territory, you can have a deeper structure involved, mainly occipital lobe, cerebellum, and brainstem getting involved. While in anterior cerebral artery territory, it will be mainly the area which is supplied by anterior cerebral artery, that is the medial surface of cerebral cortex, which is concerned with lower lip. While MCA territory will be supplying the area which will be right from lateral sulcus up to almost midline. This is an area which will be superior division and inferior division. And you will have a penetrating branch which will be supplying a deeper structure like internal capsule, hypothalamus, thalamus and basal ganglia where there are chance of getting lacunar infarcts. So you can have a cortical damage, you can have a brainstem damage. Brainstem damage is always by and large because of the vertebrobasilar artery territory. Because brainstem is supplied by vertebrobasilar artery territory. Now, roughly to differentiate between three big groups, thrombosis, embolism and hemorrhage and TIA. That is a fourth group. This is a good slide showing you the difference. That is thrombosis very frequently occurs in morning while embolic is during day, during activity and hemorrhagic stroke is also during activity while TIA can occur at any time. Onset of thrombosis, minimum damage, embolism, maximum damage. In hemorrhagic, maximum damage with raised intracranial pressure and altered level of consciousness is the most common finding in hemorrhagic stroke. While in TIA, the symptom signs are minimum. So in thrombosis and this is minimum. Progress-wise, thrombosis step-ladder pattern, while embolic, by and large, always static. 
while hemorrhagic not treated rapid deterioration tia will recover fully good number of time within one hour risk factor in case of thrombosis is hypertension diabetes cardiometabolic syndromes and we usually label that as atherosclerosis while in case of embolic phenomena hypertension diabetic cardiometabolic syndrome that is atherosclerotic artery to artery embolization and you can also have from cardioembolic phenomena while hemorrhagic stroke is very frequently hypertension is the factor and also there will be what we call as av malformation or berry aneurysms and amyloidosis while in tia the basic risk factor will be atherosclerosis thrombosis will be accounting for 85% embolics is again a part of that which will be 85% hemorrhagic is 15% while tia usually recovers within 1 hour and if we divide ischemic strokes that is thrombosis and embolism among which the thrombosis is accounting for more number of percentage while embolism is less as compared to thrombosis and in hemorrhage 10% of those 15% is intracranial and 5% is subarachnoid hemorrhage difference between ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic strokes loss of consciousness is more common with hemorrhagic headache is more common with hemorrhagic raised intracranial pressure will produce headache vomiting and altered level of consciousness that will be more common with hemorrhagic in ischemic there will be more chance of previous tia which will not be there in a case of hemorrhage gradual onset is more common with ischemic while always in hemorrhagic it is sudden onset among ischemic embolic is of sudden onset ischemic will be usually not much commonly related to activity particularly thrombotic while embolic is very frequently along with activity while hemorrhagic stroke is very frequently during activity blood pressure is more common with hemorrhagic rather than ischemic strokes csf will show you presence of blood in hemorrhagic may not so xanthochromia or presence of rbc in csf in case of ischemic strokes but may be present occasionally so in ischemic stroke these are the risk factors that is coronary artery disease ischemic heart disease diabetic smoking atrial fibrillation previous mi while in case of hemorrhagic hypertension and anticoagulants or fibrinolytics or we call thrombolytics is more common and here you will always have symptom signs of raised intracranial pressure with altered mental status by and large this is very frequently during sleep we call early morning while this can occur at any time of the day and particularly during activity these are the diagrams which we have already discussed circle of willis blood supply i am not going into detail at present we'll be discussing in a routine lecture which i'll take in college so this is a blood supply this is anterior cerebellar artery this is middle cerebellar artery this is posterior cerebellar artery so you should be aware of which portion of the brain is being supplied so i'm just showing you some of the photographs at your leisure time you can go through and that will help you out because we cannot discuss so much in detail in this particular chapter so this is an inferior view this is medial surface this is lateral surface this is inferior surface you can see this is a portion of anterior cerebellar artery this is a portion you can see this is an anterior cerebellar artery which is supplied and this is by a posterior cerebellar artery circulation or we call vertebro basilar artery circulation vertebro basilar artery circulation this is anterior cerebellar artery this is posterior cerebellar artery this is posterior cerebellar artery this is mca territory and this is 
ACA territory. You can see here, this is blood supply to the brain. This is vertebrobasilla. This is internal carotid artery, which is a further divides into anterior cerebellar and middle cerebellar. So this entire portion is by anterior circulation. This is posterior circulation. This is called pica, ica, pca. Pica is posterior inferior cerebral artery, anterior inferior cerebral artery, cerebellar artery, and PCA is posterior cerebellar artery, which is a part of basilar, part of basilar artery. And that will be supplying occipital lobe, cerebellum, and part of the brain stems, midbrain, pons, and medulla. These are the cut section. This portion is anterior cerebellum. This entire is middle cerebellum. And this will be PCA. And these are the PCA deep branches. And this will be MCA deep branches, which will be supplying internal capsule, then thalamus, hypothalamus, etc. Those will be penetrating branches. So again, there's a lot of different photographs showing you circle of willis and different branches. This is venous system. Eyeball is drained into cavernous sinus and then cavernous sinus is drained into internal jugular. While we have got a superior sagittal sinus, we have got inferior sagittal sinus which will be draining cortical veins and different branches then it will become straight sinus, lateral sinus, and then continue as an internal jugular vein, superior vena cava, and right atrium. So this will be the training. So even occlusion of this particular venous system also can end up with damage to the brain. Now we are going to what we call as stroke, how you come to the diagnosis. We usually use the word fast, that is facial drop, so drooping of the facial angle, we call upper motor neuron facial. So eyebrow can be lifted up, you will have a furrowing present on both the sides, but on the opposite side of the cerebral damage, you will have an angle of the mouth drooping nasolabial fold will not be seen so that is called facial droop you will have a weakness in upper arm as well as weakness in lower limb may be present so arm weaknesses that is hemiplegia because of involvement of tongue and fish person will have a speech disturbances so it is called f a s and we have to take timely action that's why it is called fast. This is early recognition. There is one more called as a rosier. So if there is a loss of consciousness, seizures, somatic weakness, speech disturbances, and visual disturbances, this is called rosier way of recognition. And once you recognize, you can go for NIHS method of examination where you look for level of consciousness, motor function, sensory function, language, attention, etc. So you can go for that and you then subject him to an investigation like CT head without contrast, which will help you to differentiate between hemorrhagic stroke and infarct or we call ischemic strokes. Because hemorrhagic strokes, blood will appear bright and that will be showing you as a opaque shadow or a white shadow then you can go for MRI which will be helping you to differentiate ischemic strokes then you can go for carotid doppler ultrasound head and neck angiography you can combine with CT angio or MRI angio but this takes time so first earliest thing you can go for CT head and then followed by either MRI or carotid uh, angiography with CT or MRI and you can try to find out the modifiable risk factors like lipids, 
diabetes, coagulative disorders, etc. So face, arm, speech, and tongue that is called act fast. So that is drooping, facial drooping. Here you can see that there is a drooping on the left side, left side drooping, arm weakness, speech disturbances, and you have to act very fast. Now there is another thing which is called be fast. Two more things are being added. Sudden loss of balance or even altered level of consciousness. Visual symptoms that is E for eye, B for balance. Loss of vision, one or both eye may be there. Face, arm, speech and T here is not time. It is terrible headache or we call thunderclap headache. That is rapid stroke assessment. It is called be fast. And depending upon the area of damage, look for motor findings, look for sensory findings. So that should be done. So you have got different lobes. This is roughly giving you what can be the findings. Frontal lobe is concerned with motor movement and executive functions. Parietal lobe is sensory, occipital lobe is vision, and temporal lobe is for hearing, that is auditory, smell, that is olfactory, memory, face recognition, languages, etc. And brainstem is concerned with heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, GI functions, and maintaining level of consciousness. And cerebellum is concerned with coordination, tone and balance. So depending upon the involvement, you will have this particular finding being affected. So this should be kept in mind. And whenever the right side is damaged, right side of the brain or right cerebral hemisphere is damaged, you will have finding on the left side regarding sensory as well as motor. Because right side controls left side of the body and left side controls right side of the body. And if person is right-handed, left cerebral hemisphere is dominant. So whenever you get a dominant hemisphere damage, you can have aphasias, different type of aphasias. Now, depending upon which artery is in being involved. So anterior or middle cerebral artery strokes will be associated with motor involvement, Broca's area involvement, and you can have also involvement of Wernicke's area. So Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia and motor weakness will be very, very common with anterior or we call MCA territory. While visual disturbances, brainstem damage, cerebellar findings will be more common with posterior artery circulations. So always look for NIHS score. If score is zero, there is no evidence of stroke. If score is between zero to four, it is minor stroke. Five to 15, moderate stroke. 16 to 20, moderate to severe. And more than 21, it is called severe stroke. This is useful for even the discharge side. So depending upon all the different assessment in NIH, stroke score. So it is called NIH stroke score. NIHSS. NIHSS. So National Institute of this is NIHS stroke score. So I'll be just coming after that. There is an ABCD score we already mentioned. So it is called ABCD2 score or ABCD3 I score. So age more than 61, blood pressure more than 140-91, then speech disturbances 1, unilateral weakness 2, duration wise between 10 to 50, that is 10 to 60 minutes 1, 
more than 62 diabetes mellitus present one here dual tia not applicable but here in 3i it is two score imaging findings ipsilateral 50 percent stenosis two score acute diffusion weight imaging showing you hyper intensity two score so depending upon that you give the risk score and then this is seven is the total while here it is 30 so depending upon that score you can give the risk and severity here in niha level of consciousness as the patient regarding the months and their age then blink the eye horizontal extraocular movements visual fields facial pulsing left arm motor drifts right arm motor drift left leg motor drift right arm right leg limb ataxia sensory findings language and aphasia dysarthria and extinction all these are examined in detail and then you give the score and that is called nih stroke score after examining you can go for immediate workup like you have confirmed that there is a presence of an ischemic stroke now you can go for non-contrast ct to rule out intracranial hemorrhage also you should try to rule out a stroke mimics if you are suspecting like hypoglycemia seizures migraine hypertensive encephalopathy or psychological disorders establish timing of the strokes so that you can decide regarding starting of thrombolytic therapy and try to find out the risk factors for not contraindication for thrombolysis and you can determine the severity by nih stroke scale so i'm ending the first part of stroke here in next portion we'll be going to what we call as approach to stroke examination investigations localization what are the different findings with territory etc and then finally the treatment part so i thank you all for taking out time i know that your time is valuable and i appreciate you for spending some of the time with me so see you in next part if you like this particular lecture don't forget to press button like subscribe press bell icon so that you can get a message when i upload the second video and if you like this lecture you can share with your friends and you can give your suggestions so that i can improve on making a better presentation i feel this will be very helpful to you in your theory exam as well as in your oral exams and it will be also useful in your everyday practice so see you in next lecture